All right. Hello. This is my walkthrough of Philip Opperman's writing an OS in Rust. Uh, we have gotten through almost all of the memory management section and we are now on allocator designs. This first video is going to do the introduction and then the bump allocator. Uh, and then the next two videos will be the other two allocators. So let's go through the introduction first. Um, this post explains how to implement heap allocators from scratch. It presents and discusses different allocator designs, including bump allocation, linked list allocation, and fixed size block allocation. For each of the three designs, we will create a basic implementation that can be used for our kernel. Introduction. In the previous post, we added basic support for heap allocations to our kernel. For that, we created a new memory region in the page tables and used the linked list allocator crate to manage that memory. While we have a working heap now, we left most of the work to the allocator crate without trying to understand how it works. In this post, we will show how to create our own heap allocator from scratch instead of relying on an existing allocator crate. We will discuss different allocator designs, including a simplistic bump allocator, and a basic fixed size block allocator and use this knowledge to implement an allocator with improved performance compared to the linked list allocator crate. It would be nice if we had tools to measure performance. Maybe we're going to get to that. Design goals. The responsibility of an allocator is to manage the available heap memory. It needs to return unused memory on alloc calls and keep track of memory freed by dealloc so that it can be reused again. Most importantly, it must never hand out memory that is already in use somewhere else because this would cause undefined behavior. Apart from correctness, there are many secondary design goals. For example, the allocator should effectively utilize the available memory and keep fragmentation low. Furthermore, it should work well for concurrent applications and scale to any number of processors. For maximal performance, it could even optimize memory layout with respect to the CPU caches to prove improve cache locality and avoid false sharing. These requirements can make good allocators very complex. For example, J.E. Malik has over 30,000 lines of code. This complexity is often undesired in kernel code where a single bug can lead to severe security vulnerabilities. Fortunately, the allocation patterns of kernel code are often much simpler compared to user space code, so that relatively simple allocator designs often suffice. In the following, we present three possible kernel allocator designs and explain their advantages and drawbacks. Okay, so the first allocator we're going to look at uh, today in this video is the bump allocator. Uh, the most simple allocator design is a bump allocator, also known as a stack allocator. It allocates memory linear linearly and only keeps track of the number of allocated bytes and the number of allocations. It's only useful in very specific use cases because it has severe limitation. It can only free all memory at once. There are certain, at least in user space, there are certain programs that could just use allocator like this because they only run once and then they exit. So they only ever have to allocate memory and never have to worry about freeing it because they just exit the program and the memory gets freed. Um, so this is useful. It's, it's very performant because it only has to do one thing, allocate, keep track of where the next pointer is. Uh, but the drawback, obviously, is that we can never free memory or just free everything all at once. Idea. The idea behind a bump allocator is to linearly allocate memory by increasing, bumping, a next variable, which points at the beginning of the unused memory. At the beginning, next is equal to the start address of the heap. On each allocation, next is increased by the allocation so that only it always points to the boundary between used and unused memory. The next pointer only moves in a single direction and thus never hands out the same memory region twice. When it reaches the end of the heap, no more memory can be allocated, resulting in an out of memory error on the next allocation. A bump allocator is often implemented with an allocation counter, which is increased by one on each alloc call and in decreased by one on each dealloc call. When the allocation counter reaches zero, it means that all allocations on the heap were deallocated. In this case, the next pointer can be reset to the start address of the heap so that the complete heap memory is available to allocations again. 
All right, so we're going to implement this, but this is not going to be our actual allocator, right? We're clearing, right? Status. There we go. Oh, oh, I never added the um, heap allocation test. Let's do that now. Uh, HG. Git add tests. Git commit gem heap allocation te test. Leftover from the last stream. Okay. So in our source allocator, we're going to create a bump allocator module. Okay. Um, pub mod bump. And then we're going to make a source allocator, source allocator bump. Okay. So here we start our implementation by declaring a new allocator bump submodule. The content of the submodule lives in a new source allocator bump file, which we will create with the following content. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. They're all U sizes, allocations, U size. So this must be the the um, the thing that we were talking about in the description. We start and we have a start and end range. We have the next pointer, which increments only. And then we have a, a counter of allocations, uh, which uh, we can use to determine whether or not Ooh, that didn't work. Let's I saved this, right? So pub mod bump should be there. Okay. So now we have two warnings that we're not using. Okay. I didn't see that the last time. Okay, impl bump allocator bump const fn new cell. This is almost a default, right? Heap start. I mean, we could, right? We could get away with that. Nope, trait default is not implemented for bump allocator. I wonder if default, does default exist in no standard? Can I call a not, oh, if it's a const function, you can't, can't do that. Okay, fair enough. I was trying to save a little, a little, um, actually just need these four lines, right? And change all these U sizes to zero. Um, Okay, so just that, and then we have the initializer. And this, oh, well, I wonder why we can't just do that in, do this in the new function. Oh, then it can't be const maybe? And we need const for maybe a global uh, initializer or something? Oh, I keep doing that. I did this in the last stream. This should be size. And self next is equal to heap start. Okay, so the heap start and heap end fields keep track of the lower and upper bound of the heap memory region. The caller needs to ensure that these addresses are valid, otherwise the allocator would return invalid memory. For this reason, the init function needs to be unsafe to call. There's nothing unsafe here, so will Rust complain? No. It's just complained that we're not using bump alligator. Because there's nothing unsafe about these instructions. Or these uh, statements, rather. All right. We're just saying it's unsafe. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Uh, the purpose of the next field is to always point to the first unused byte of the heap, i.e. the starting address of the next allocation. It is set to heap, st heap start in the init function because at the beginning, the complete heap is unused. On each allocation, this field will be increased by the allocation size, bumped, to ensure that we don't return the same memory region twice. The allocations field is a simple counter 
for the active allocations with the goal of resetting the allocator after the last allocation was freed. It is initialized with zero. We chose to create a separate init function instead of performing the initialization directly in new in order to keep the interface identical to the allocator provided by the linked list allocator crate. This way the allocators can be switched without additional code changes. Implementing global alloc. As explained in the previous post, all heap allocations need to implement the global alloc trait, which is defined like this. Right. We looked at that last time. Only the alloc and dealloc methods are required. The other two methods have default implementations and can be omitted. All right, here's our first implementation attempt. Let's try to implement the alloc method for our bump allocator. So here, I guess at the top, we can say use alloc, alloc, global alloc, and layout. And then we're going to do an unsafe impl global alloc for our bump allocator. Unsafe fn alloc self. Oh, this won't work, right? Because we don't have a mutable reference to self. To do alignment and bounds check. Size and the self allocations plus equals one alloc start as star mute u eight. So this this line I think is unsafe. So that's why we have to make this oops unsafe. If we're saying the whole impl is unsafe, do we need to say that the fu this function itself is unsafe? And then we have an unsafe fn d alloc self pointer star mute u8 and then our layout layout to do bang yeah okay so this should fail right self is an ampersand reference so data refers to cannot assign to self allocate yeah okay first we use the next field as the start address of our allocation then we update the next field to point at the end address of the allocation which is the next unused address on the heap before returning the start address of the allocation as star mute u8 pointer, we increase the allocation's counter by one. Note that we don't perform any bounds checks or alignment adjustments, so this implementation is not safe yet. This does not matter much because it fails to compile anyway with the following error. Right, we can't, we can't modify self next or self allocations because we don't have a mutable reference to self. The error occurs because the alloc and dealloc methods of global alloc trait only operate on an immutable self-reference, so updating the next and allocations fields is not possible. This is problematic because updating next on every allocation is the essential principle of a bump allocator. Global alloc and mutability. Before we look at a possible solution to this mutability problem, let's try to understand why the global alloc trait methods are defined with self-arguments, immutable self-arguments. As we saw in the previous post, the global heap allocator is defined by adding the global allocator attribute to a static that implements the global alloc trait. Static variables are immutable in Rust, so there's no way to call a method that takes a mute self on a static allocator. For this reason, all the methods of global alloc only take immutable self-reference. Fortunately, there is a way. We should remove that word. Right. Fortunately, there's a way to get a mutable reference to self from an immutable reference to self. We can use synchronized interior mutability by wrapping the allocator in a spin mutex spin lock. This type provides a lock method that performs mutual exclusion and thus safely returns a mutable, an immutable self-reference to a mutable self-reference. We already used the wrapper type multiple times in our kernel, for example, for the VGA text buffer. A locked wrapper type. With the help of the spin mutex wrapper type, we can implement the global alloc trait for a bump allocator. The trick is to implement the trait not for the bump allocator directly, but for the wrapped spin mutex bump allocator type. So we're not going to implement global alloc for this. We're going to implement global alloc for a mutex of this. Now self is going to have is going to be um, the mutex, not the bump allocator. 
But <laughs> unfortunately, this still doesn't work because the Rust compiler does not permit trait implementations for types defined in other crates. Right, I can't implement this for this because we don't have this. We didn't define mutex, so we can't implement a... Um, we have to either own this side or this side. We can't not own both sides. Right, mutex is not defined in the current crate. To fix this, we need to create our own wrapper type around spin mutex mutex. Okay, so that's easy enough. So we're going to create in allocator a generic type. Pub struct locked a inner spin mutex a. It's more idiomatic to use the type T, but that's fine. We'll just use A and then impl A locked A pub const fun new inner A returning a self locked inner spin mutex new inner right that's the new function and then pub fun lock self return to spin mutex guard a self inner lock So this just is creating our own type that wraps a locked something, and then we can implement. Um, oops, we can implement a four for um, for this type. Well, let me read what it says first. Um, this won't work because this is still going to fail here. But the other one compiled, right? This is the only error we're getting. So that means our what I just typed in worked. The type is a generic wrapper around the spin mutex A. It imposes no restrictions on the wrap type A, so it can be used to wrap all kinds of types, not just allocators. It provides a simple new constructor function that wraps a given value. For convenience, it also provides a lock function that calls the lock on the wrapped mutex. Since the locked type is general enough to be useful for other allocator implementations too, we put it in the parent allocator module. Right, so we're gonna just, we can use it for any type I wonder if this should be implementing DREF instead of having its own lock, which calls lock. That that would be an interesting enhancement if that's possible. I don't know. I've I've haven't done DREF stuff before. I've used it, but I haven't implemented it, so I might be off the reservation at this point. All right. So implementation for locked bump allocator. The locked type is defined in our own crate, so we can use it to implement global alloc for a bump allocator. Absolutely, let's do that. So now instead of saying spin mutex, we say locked, right? Okay, now we're gonna do the whole shebang here. We're gonna say let bump self lock. And now, even though this was passed in is immutably, we can still lock the inner mutex using the self-lock function. Um, right, and now we have a mutable reference to uh, the mutex guard. Ooh, why is that unknown? Maybe because this doesn't compile? Nope, it still says unknown. Oh, do I have to import it? Ah, I have to say use super. Oh, there's a and a line up. We haven't written that. We have global layout label and we use core pointer. Okay. If I do that now, can I see the type? Yes. Okay. Now it's a mutex guard of a bump allocator. Perfect. Okay. So now we say let start is equal to align up bump next layout align alloc end is equal to match on alloc start checked add layout size if it worked some end then we're going to give it the end otherwise if it did not work then we're going to return pointer 
no mute and that's that so that's the alloc end if alloc end is greater than bump heap end should we say equal to pointer no mute i'm wondering if this should be greater than or equal to because if the alloc end is equal to the heap end that means oh unless alloc end is one past yeah okay that makes sense else bump.next is equal to alloc end bump allocations plus equals one and alloc start as star mute u8 okay and then we have the d alloc this won't compile because we don't have a line up yet um and i'm just going to scan forward real quick yeah here's line up okay uh, I, I was going to say, uh, you know, I can't hit compile. Well, I can hit compile. It's just going to complain about a lineup. Ooh, at least we can get that fixed, right? And a lineup doesn't work. And that's the only error. So I think we're I think we're good. Okay, so dialloc is let mute bump is equal to self lock. We don't need the comment again. Bump allocations minus equals one. If bump allocations equals zero bump.next equal to bump.heap start. Okay, so that was pretty simple. Again, we only have that one error. The first step for both alloc and dealloc is to call the mutex lock method through the inner field to get a mutable reference to the wrapped allocator type. The instance remains locked until the end of the method so that no data race can occur in multi-threaded contexts. We will add threading support soon. Compared to the previous prototype, the alloc implementation now respects alignment requirements and performs a bounds check to ensure that the allocations stay inside the heap memory region. The first step is to round up the next address to the alignment specified by the layout argument. The code for the align up function is shown in a moment. We then add the requested allocation size to the alloc start here uh, to get the end address of the allocation. To prevent integer overflow on large allocations, we use the checked add method. If an overflow occurs or if the resulting end address of the allocation is larger than the end address of the heap, we return a null pointer to signal an out of memory situation. Otherwise, we update the next address and increase the allocations counter like one by one like before. Finally, we return alloc start address converted to a star mute eight star mute u8 pointer. The dealloc function ignores the given pointer and layout arguments. Instead, it just decreases the allocations counter. If the counter reaches zero again, it means that all allocations were freed again. In this case, it resets the next address to the heap start address to make the complete heap memory available again. Address alignment. The align up function is general enough that we can put it in the parent allocator. Okay. So we'll just put it here, I guess. This is uh, interesting because it's a, um, a integer mod, right? Because we're using use sizes, so we don't have to worry about floating point numbers. If remainder equals zero, adder else adder minus remainder plus a line. Okay, yeah, it's a simple enough function. Okay, now we have a line up, and it still doesn't work. Oh, because I have to put it up here. There, okay, that compiles. The function first computes the remainder of the division of adder by align. If the remainder is zero, the address is already aligned with the given alignment. Otherwise, we align the address by subtracting the remainder so that the new remainder is zero, and then adding the alignment so that the address does not become smaller than the original address. Note that this isn't the most efficient way to implement this function. A much faster implementation looks like this. This method utilizes the global alloc trait, guarantees that a line is always a power of two. This makes it possible to create a bit mask to align the address in a very efficient way. To understand how it works, let's go through it step by step, starting on the right side. Why don't we just start with this? Why, why do we need both? 
um, add error plus align minus one and not align minus one. Okay. Since the align is the power of two, its binary representation has only a single bit set. It means align minus one has all the lower bits set. By creating a bitwise not for the not operator, we get a number that has all the bits set except for the bits lower than the align, right? By performing a bitwise and on an address and align minus one, we align the address downwards. This works by clearing all the bits that are lower than the align. Since we want to align upwards instead of downwards, we increase the adder by align minus one before performing the bitwise and. This way, already aligned addresses remain the same while non-aligned addresses are rounded to the next alignment boundary. Which variant you choose is up to you. Both compute the same result, only using different methods. Yeah, this is this is pretty standard, I think, alignment algorithm. So that's fine. Using it. To use the bump allocator, instead of the linked list allocator crate, we need to update the allocator static in allocator.rs. So we have pubmod bump. We'll put this here, use bump, bump allocator. Right? Put that in the right spot. And then we're going to change this from locked heap to locked bump allocator. And here we'll just say knocked new bump allocator new. Yeah. So this is why this needed to be a const fun function because we're initializing the static and we didn't want to use a lazy static in this instance, I guess. And that gives us two warnings. Oh, that we're not using linked list allocator anymore. Okay. So we no longer need that guy. All right. Here it becomes important that we declared bump allocator new and locked new as const functions. If there were normal functions, a compilation error would occur because the initialization initialization expression of a static must evaluate must be evaluable evaluable <laughs> at compile time we don't need to change the allocator lock init heap start heap size colon or init heap function because the bump allocator provides the same interface as the allocator provided by the linked list allocator right now our kernel uses a bump allocator everything should still work including the heap allocation tests that we created in the previous post Okay, cargo test, test, heap, allocator. Oh, allocation. Oops, with only one T. All right, all, all of them work. Simple allocation, large vec, and many boxes. Okay, discussion. The big advantage of our bump allocation is that it's very fast compared to other allocator designs that need to actively look for a fitting memory block and perform various bookkeeping tests on alloc and dealloc. A bump allocator can be optimized to just a few assembly instructions. This makes bump allocators useful for optimizing the allocation performance, for example, when creating a virtual DOM library. I wonder why he's calling that particular thing out. While a bump allocator is seldom used as a global allocator, the principle of bump allocation is often applied in form of arena allocation, which basically batches individual allocations together to improve performance. An example for an arena allocator for Rust is the toolshed crate. The drawback of a bump allocator. The main limitation of a bump allocator is that it can only reuse deallocated memory after all allocations have been freed. This means that a single long-lived allocation suffices to prevent memory reuse. We can see this when we add a variation of the many boxes test. Okay, let's add that. Move this up a little bit so it's not at the bottom of the screen there. Fn many boxes, long-lived. EQ long lived is equal to one. Right, so what's happening here in many boxes is that we allocate free, allocate free, allocate free. So we're able to, the dealloc can actually free all of the memory. Here we're going to create a new one 
then do a bunch of allocates and freeze. But because this one is hasn't been deallocated yet, uh, we can't deallocate any memory, so we're going to run out of memory. Um, that's my read of it. Let's see what they say. Like the box, like the many boxes test, this test creates a large number of allocations to provoke an out of memory failure if the allocator does not reuse freed memory. Additionally, the test creates a long lived allocation, which lives for the whole loop execution. When we try to run our new test, we see that it indeed fails. Okay. So we should see that here. Um, fails for the wrong reason. Let's try again. There we go, failed. Let's try to understand why this failure occurs in detail. First, the long-lived allocation is created at the start of the heap, thereby increasing the allocation's counter by one. For each iteration of the loop, a short-lived allocation is created and directly freed again before the next iteration starts. This means that the allocation's counter is temporarily increased to two at the beginning of an iteration and decreased to one at the end of it. The problem is now the bump problem now is that the bump allocator can only reuse memory when all allocations have been freed, i.e. the allocations counter falls to zero. Since this doesn't happen before the end of the loop, each loop iteration allocates a new region of memory, leading to an out of memory error after the number of iterations. Fixing the test, question mark. There are two potential tricks that we could utilize to fix the test for our bump allocator. We could update dalloc to check whether the freed allocation was the last allocation returned by alloc by comparing its end address with the next pointer. In case they're equal, we can safely reset next back to the start address of the freed allocation. This way, each loop iteration reuses the same memory block. We could add an alloc back method that allocates memory from the end of the heap using an additional next back field. Then we could manually use this allocation method for all long-lived allocations thereby separating short-lived and long-lived allocations on the heap. Note that this separation only works if it's clear beforehand how long each allocation lives. Another drawback of this approach is that manually performing allocations is cumbersome and potentially unsafe. Yes. While both of these approaches work to fix the test, there's no, they are no general solution since they are only able to reuse memory in very specific cases. The question is, is there a general solution that reuses reuses all freed memory. As we learned in the previous post, allocations can live arbitrarily long and can be freed in an arbitrary order. This means that we need to keep track of a potentially unbounded number of non-continuous, non-contiguous, unused memory regions as illustrated by the following example. The graphic shows the heap over the course of time. At the beginning, the complete heap is available, is unused, sorry, and the next address is equal to heap start. Then the first allocation occurs. In line three, a second memory block is allocated and the first allocation is freed. Many more allocations are added in line four. Half of them are very short lived and already get freed in line five where another new allocation is added. Line five shows the potential problem. If we have five unused memory regions with different sizes in total, but the next pointer can only point to the beginning of the last region. While we could store the start address and sizes of the other unused memory regions in an array of size four for this example, this isn't a general solution since we could easily create an example with eight, 16, or a thousand unused memory regions. Normally when we have a potentially unbounded number of items, we can just use a heap allocated collection. This isn't really possible in our case since the heap allocator can't depend on itself. It would cause endless recursion or deadlocks. So we need to find a different solution. All right, so that's bump allocation. Let's uh, get status. Uh, bump allocator with uh, failing test to show why it's not ideal. There we go.